Argon. All right, uh, thank you all for coming. I think this talk will be a little bit different. Um, I think most of you are interested in probably the start of the presentation. So yeah, so this is a little different. So I, I work in the Energy Systems Division at Argonne National Laboratory, and I study the relationship between energy and water. So our, our energy systems are highly dependent on water. <coughs> uh, like we need to use water to make um, electricity, crude oil, to grow biofuels, all different uh, forms of energy require water. So, so that's what I focused on. A few years ago, I was, uh, work, started working on a project looking at biofuels. And uh, we decided to use the hydrological simulation program in Fortran to, to try to analyze the biofuel systems. And I was kind of unsatisfied with the tools that I found to try to help run that, uh, to gather the input data and to run it to get output. And so I decided to, to build this um, uh, Python platform to do that, to do all those tasks. So, um, so just kind of briefly what I'm going to go over here is because I assume that most of the people here are not really familiar with hydrology or with watershed modeling. I'm going to give you, I'm going to, the first half of the presentation will be sort of going over uh, that, that sort of background and how that works with the computer program. And then I'm going to talk about how PyHSPF works, some of the important classes, and then a very short uh, little bit of output from uh, the results of the model. And then talk a little bit about some other, other things I'd like to do in the future. So uh, I just thought I'd begin by sort of saying, imagine that you're looking at a river at a point in a stream or a river somewhere, and you wanted to be able to predict over a very long time the flow and the quality of the water at that point in the river. If you think about it, there are many, many, many variables that influence that because water flows downhill in natural systems, and so everything that is upstream of that point is going to have some kind of at least nebulous impact on the water quality. So uh, hydrology is sort of inherently data-driven because there are so many different factors, and this diagram kind of shows a little bit of that. Uh, agriculture consumes water, as I alluded to before. If we withdraw lots of water for electricity, for other kinds of industries, uh, we, we build dams to slow the water movement of water down across land surfaces. And if you were to look at this point down here at the bottom, uh, the, the flow in the river at that point depends on all the things above it upstream. So it's possible if you have an elevation map, you can sort of follow that, uh, the, the top of the ridge line out from there and create a, a, a geographic region. And everything inside that region is what feeds all, all the precipitation, all the other things that happen to water inside that region feed out to that point. So uh, things that happen out here would, would probably go to some other river system outside. So um, anyway, to do this, you need a, a, a simulation tool that takes all these things into account. So all the, the water that's in the river comes from precipitation. So you, you need climate data for that. And then as the water moves across land surfaces, it gets consumed naturally by evapotranspiration. And all these processes that we do, hum, we humans do, uh, have some kind of impact on that. So so that's the basic idea. And so to try to think about this in a quantitative sense, uh, you can write, this is the way that I think about it, a, a simple, relatively simple equation for all the different things that influence um, water quality. So this upper left diagram shows the a catchment area for, for this uh, basin that I'm kind of using as my example, which is the North Skunk River in Iowa. Sorry. Uh, and this red dot is a gauge where we measured the flow consistently over the last 50 years. And so all the, the rain that falls inside here exits at this point. And so you have the physical connectivity of all these little bitty streams throughout here. And you have the slope of the land. All those characteristics are one piece of the, of the modeling equation. Uh, the, the next piece of the equation is the land use. So all the different kinds of ways that land is used inside there. So we have corn, soybeans, growth, uh, cities that you develop and pave the land swamps, forests, each of those things is going to consume a different amount of water as water moves across that land surface. So it's important to know how much of these different land categories you have. Another big factor is the climate, obviously. The more rain you have, the more water that's available. But then also, when it's hotter or drier, you're going to have more water consumption naturally by the land. So you have to think about the climate if you're going to look at a long-term simulation. And the last factor are the hydrology process parameters. And I'm not going to try to spend a lot of time talking to you about hydrology, but just kind of briefly. Things like how fast water infiltrates into soil and how much evapotranspiration happens by trees. The, these processes all um, are the four basic inputs that tell you what the surface water flow will be downstream in the river. So each of these things requires data. And so here's a really simple example of how HSPF might work. So if you were looking at a region, you wanted to be able to predict uh, or you wanted to be able to try to understand some sort of impact of, of human activities on water. 
uh, you say, ah, we have a gauge station here, this is nice, so we can look at the, the data from this station and other data about the watershed and, and try to, to draw some inference about what's going on there. So if you start at the gauge station, you first have to go upstream and find all the major tributaries. So that's, that's what you would do first. And then for each of these tributaries, you'd move over and say, well, what, what area of the map, what land feeds that tributary, which if you have an elevation map, you can figure out. So all the, the land, for example, in this piece here feeds this stream, and then this stream feeds into that stream along with that land, et cetera. So once you've done that, you can do little water budgets on each of these land segments and river reaches and use that to try to uh, do continuous simulations. Um, now, within each of those, you're going to want to subdivide it based on the different kinds of land you have. So you have to go in and count the pixels using some image processing to do that to, to create these different land segments. So those are kind of the first three steps. The last things are you have to supply how much rain goes to each of these and how much water gets consumed by uh, evapotranspiration. And then you need to do a, a calibration process. So once you have the the flow in this river, you can go back and try to calculate those hydrology parameters based on an inversion technique. So that's the basic uh, idea. And here's a really simple example of a hypothetical watershed uh, model that you could create in something like HSPF. So this is, imagine a, a little stream network. We have one stream here that's fed by two other upstreams, okay? And then this stream is fed also by some land area. And then this, this other stream would be fed by, maybe this is a cornfield here, and over here, maybe we have another cornfield that feeds this stream, and then some, maybe a city here. Each of these things is going to be different. So you can do water budgets on each of these, figure out how much rain comes in, how much water gets consumed, what doesn't get consumed becomes runoff, and then it goes downstream. So this is the, the kind of calculation logic that you would use. Uh, and then within each of those land segments, there are different pieces. So I don't want to spend a ton of time, because I, I assume that most of you aren't uh, well familiar with hydrology, or maybe you're just interested, but you... Uh, within each of those segments, they have a, a canopy layer, so that's the rain that gets caught on the way to the ground, and then once it gets to the ground, some of that will run off overland, some of it will infiltrate into the soil and go into the groundwater table where it runs off. And uh, the main point I want to make here, I guess, is that each of these is governed by hydrology process parameters that we don't necessarily know exactly, so we have to go back and figure those later. And then we have uh, external time series that we have to supply, so for every point in time, I need to know the rain, and I need to know the water consumption demand, which is we call the potential evapotranspiration. So I have to go and find these things to be able to provide that to the model. So um, I've talked a little bit about evapotranspiration, which I assume most of you aren't real familiar with, so just kind of briefly. It's uh, this nice little diagram here. Um, water comes in, and you have plants that, can, that pull water out of the root system and transfer it into the air, then you also get some natural... Uh, evaporation from the soil surface, and over a large scale, you can't really differentiate these. And so just thinking about what's going to impact that, it, it depends on the temperature, the humidity, the wind, the sunlight, all these climate factors, and we have a nice equation. There's been a lot of research done on that to predict um, how much, to, to just look at the evaporation demand from the atmosphere for like water to take all those into account. And then there's some empirical work that's done for different kinds of vegetation you can use to adjust that depending on what kind of crops you might have there. Um, and then the last factor is the soil moisture, which is continuously changing. And so to keep track of that, you have to use a watershed model. So that's kind of how you, how you think about all that. So just in summary, these are all the things you need to make HSPF work. You need to understand the physical connection of the land, and there are data sets for that. Then you need to understand the different pieces that are on the landscape, and then you need to be able to go and gather climate time series for a very long simulation period. And then last, you need a stream flow and gauge parameters that you can use to compare your simulation with to go and uh, it's tweak your model and optimize it. So uh, PyHSPF is the package that I designed to, to do this. And so um, the HSPF source code is, is open source. Uh, it's, it's Fortran has a little bit of C for memory allocation. And I went through and figured out how to recompile it, which was not a simple thing, but uh, figured out how to get it to compile in a relatively simple way. And then I wrote some uh, sort of dummy routines that you can use with this uh, tool called F2Pi that's shipped with NumPy, and you can use that to actually build um, connections between Fortran code and Python so that you can just import those subroutines from Fortran directly into Python. Uh, so I was able to call the HSPF library directly inside of Python with this and some of the other important subroutines that I need to be able to use to make the input files. So then you need Python, and then there's some other modules I use. Uh, GDAL to do image processing, uh, PyShape to work with those shape files like uh, 
vector data. Um, and matplotlib to make, to make plots and numpy for arrays, et cetera. So these are some of the databases. These mostly are, these three are climate-based. And then you also have the cropland data layer that's a really excellent data set, 30 meter grid, and it's been released every year nationwide since 2008. And it goes back to the late 90s for some states. National Water Information System, and then this NHG Plus, which has the connection between all these different river segments in, in the uh, US. And so the idea is that uh, PyHSPF will use Python tools to go and automatically get this information and then bring it into the form that HSPF can understand, run it, and then develop a model. So that's the, the idea. And this is kind of a busy, I know, diagram, but this serves uh, the information flow into um, PyHSPF. So anything that's a purple oval is something that has to be supplied to HSPF. And HSPF is very flexible. It doesn't make any assumptions. You can divide the m map up any way you want to. Uh, you can supply time series any way you want to. If you want half of it to be this amount of rain and half of it to have this other rain series, you can do that however you want. So all these purple things have to be supplied. And I created some uh, data containers to, to store the information. So the subbasin ones take inf information about the flow plane and the, the reach and what kind of land use you have and store that for a given part of the map. And you put lots of those together and you get a watershed. And then you have to also say how each of those reaches are connected together, which I have using a, a dictionary. So you, you supply all that, and this gets all the land use and hydrography data into something that's a little bit easier to work with. And that's supplied to this core class. This is the most important one, the HSPF model, which stores the data, also the time series, and things about the um, simulation, like the file output. It has HSPF has a lot of different modules, depending on if you want to run water quality. So you can turn those on and off, and then special actions represent things like farming, tilling that might impact hydrology that you have to add. So once you supply all that information, okay, these, uh, anything in red here is something that's generated, and so HSPF uses this UCI file, which is a formatted Fortran file, to uh, supply the commands to, to the HSPF program. And then it has these specially formatted, unformatted direct access binary files, I believe, um, that these are the, the the files that are used to store the time series input and output information from a simulation. So you have to be able to work with those. So I made a little uh, class that interacts specifically with the HSPF library to make these files. Uh, so this thing, when you, when you have supplied all the information, it will automatically make this UCI file, which would be 10,000 lines long at times, and these for, uh, very uh, specifically formatted files to work with and runs it. And so you can sort of instantly go from something that's relatively easy to understand into these more complicated Fortran 77 things without having to do that. And then it, uh, there's some data containers that are put in there to store the hydrology parameters, and these use different classes. And so these are designed so that you can change them later if you want to go and adjust the hydrology parameters. So, so that's how that works. So this is kind of the same sort of diagram, but looking at, uh, so all these things here can be supplied by these public databases. And I was going to talk to you briefly about the NHD plus one because this contains the hydrography data. And so this is the upper Mississippi River Basin here. And uh, the hydrography data in the US is, is organized by hydrologic unit code. And so this is HUC2. So the, no, the more numbers in a, in a HUC, a hydrologic unit, the, uh, the bigger it is. So this, there are 18 of these HUC2s. Then if you have a HUC4, then this might be divided into several HUC4s. And then you go down to the HUC8 level, that's what these pieces are. So. Um, so this NHD plus extractor goes to the website and, and all, the HUC, all the NHD plus data is organized by HUC2. So if you give it a HUC8 where you know there's a gauge, that's what these blue dots are, it will go and find the HUC2 data on the web, and download it, and then once it's made those files, it'll pull out the data for the HUC8 that you need, which might be one of these, which is still a lot of information. Then there's another class here that will go in, and if you give it the, the name of the gauge, it will take that and build the watershed class that I showed you in the previous slide here that contains all this information. So that, that gets a lot of the information that's needed. Now, the land use data would have to come from another tool that I'm not going to talk about because I don't have time. Uh, so the climate data, again, there's, it's a similar thing where uh, for a given uh, point in the map, it, it goes to the web and automatically pulls all the data, and then it, you can aggregate that together if you have, let's say, 10 gauges in your in your area, you want to average them or you want to do a distance weighted average, something like that. There's lots of different ways you could do it. So it'll do all that for you and it'll go in and get, so the, this is uh, the temperature, the solar radiation from another database and the wind speed. And then these together 
So the, the evaporation demand by the atmosphere is something that you can't just know. You have to go and use a model to estimate it. So it has this uh, Penman equation that it uses to take this information and calculate it at every point in time. And the green line is the hourly uh, evaporation demand. And then uh, up here, I, I aggregated that to the, the daily level. And you can see this is plotted against some observed. There are a few stations that have observed uh, pan evaporation, where they, ha they take a pan and every day and they measure the water level. So you can use that to get a daily idea of what the evaporation is, but there's, it's too fine for you to be able to measure it at, at something less than a day. And then you can't do it in the winter if it's cold. And if it's rain, that you could get rain in there. So, so generally, you can't use the evaporation data, and you have to have some kind of model to do this. So it does all this stuff for you. Um, and so then the last piece are these hydrology parameters. And to get these, you have to, so you can know the surface water flows. You can look at these other information and go and calculate this using an inversion technique. So, um, so I made another class called an auto calibrator that starts with their, your base HSPF model, and then you tell it the, the parameters that you want to change, and you tell it what you want it to optimize, and it will go and make a copy of that. And then it will do slight perturbations on each of those parameters and see which ones, so positively and negatively perturb it. And then if they improve the, the calibration uh, it'll accept the parameters, and if not, it, it, will, um, it will leave the, the parameters the same until you reach a plateau. So it's sort of like a path of steepest ascent approach to get to a, an optimized scenario. So, so, um, so here's, a, here's the results for, this is a 28-year simulation. It's interesting, before they were talking a little bit about um, training a model versus testing the model, and that's something that we, people have been doing in hydrology for a really long time. So actually don't have the, the test results here, but I, I ran 28 years and fit the data, and you can see I got a, an R squared of about 0.86. And then I ran it for two more years, and, and the, the fit was very similar over the test period. So uh, it's an area where I, I think there's still a lot of ongoing research and people trying to decide what is the best way to do the fitting versus the, the testing. Uh, you can plot the data at looking at parity plots of um, Simulated flows versus observed flows, and then this is the cumulative distribution function, which is kind of the most important part. We're trying to capture the, the bo all the flow regimes over a long period of time. Then um, you got uh, the last way maybe you might want to plot the data is to collapse everything on the same day of the year to try to look at seasonal effects. And again, this uh, the model lined up closely. There was a little bit of an underestimation there. Um, are we out of time or? Okay, so you can, you can use this. You can go and tweak the land use. You could say, what if the land use changes from this much corn to that much, and what is the impact? And here it was about a 10% increase in corn, increased it by 5%. And I've done some other work looking at um, changing the climate parameters so we can go back and look at, at a climate change scenario and say, what if, this climate is, what if we have this climate in the future? What is, our, what is that going to do to our water availability? How much water is going to be consumed, et cetera? So... Um, Last thing, yeah, so with this approach, is, it's, it's automated, so I'd like to be able to apply it nationwide and be able to go in and do some data mining and look at uh, water quality um, and looking at different data sets and things. So, so that's everything. So if you have any questions, I will try to be around. And um, yeah, thanks very much. Okay.